This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. We're so pleased that you have joined us today. And we're also very pleased that uh, Mises University is happening this week. We have a lot of great scholars here uh, in Auburn visiting us. We have our resident economist and also editor of Mises.org, Ryan McMakin, joining us for the conversation today. And as a lot of you know, we have been going through several of Ludwig von Mises' shorter works. And happily, they're mostly his earlier works. In other words, most of his lengthier writings predated human action. And so for a lot of people who might be uh, have a little trepidation about approaching human action, there's plenty of Mises you can be reading that's simpler and shorter. And of course, we've gone through some great books like The Theory of Money and Credit, uh, we went through socialism and bureaucracy and the anti-capitalistic mentality, uh, the ultimate foundation of economic science, etc. So we are going to tackle uh, one last book before we begin to go through a multi-episode podcast uh, based on human action. So that's going to be fun. You want to stay tuned for that. And it's going to be uh, really a way to help you work through that book and perhaps get more enjoyment out of it or tackle it for the first time uh, if you've been waiting for the right moment. But before we do that, we are going to get uh, back to, to really his second uh, sort of full-length book. It is Nation, State, and Economy, written in 1919, where he is just home from what was then called the Great War uh, as in, during his stint as an officer in the Austro-Hungarian Army and an artillery officer. And of course, he's already written his treatise on money before the war, the theory of money and credit, but now he is home. Uh, he is working by day in the new Republican legislature, working on this book at night, and he's about to enter what's really a prolific period for him, the 1920s, the interwar years. And so much of what he writes in this book in liberalism, which came later in the 20s, is so absolutely prescient. Uh, he was foreseeing what might happen in Germany. He was uh, foreseeing the possibility of another great conflagration uh, following the, the what became the, you know World War One. Uh, he is talking about things that are absolutely relevant today that people are talking about. Uh, as our guest Ryan and I were discussing earlier offline, uh, even today, concepts like uh, nation and sovereignty and trade are absolutely at the forefront. Uh, even as we speak, there is a, a two-day conference going on in Washington, D.C. amongst uh, so what national conservatives is what they call themselves. And they're led, among other people, by Yoram Hazoni, who many of you know I interviewed. He has a, a book uh, called The Virtue of Nationalism that came out about a year ago. And they've got some speakers like John Bolton, the awful John Bolton, uh, Tucker Carlson. They had Peter Thiel the other night. So they are talking about concepts around nationalism and nation nationality and immigration, of course. And even in the libertarian sphere amongst organizations uh, like the Niskansen Center, there are, there are pe people saying that nationalism is completely irrational, completely ir illiberal uh, by definition. In other words, that nationalism is illiberal per se. Uh, I'm not 100% convinced that that was Mises' view, I'm not 100% convinced that's, that's my view. Uh, and of course, one of the things we're going to get into is, is the notion that Mises entertained and also Murray Rothbard elaborated on, that nation uh, is, is a spontaneous order of sorts, that nations uh, predate uh, political arrangements. And there's just a, a whole host of questions and challenges around the nation state and, and also a hot issue today of migration and immigration, that uh, we get some early sense of what Mises thought about all these things. Uh, so by way of all that backdrop and introduction, uh, I'd like to say, welcome, Ryan. It's great to have you here in Auburn. Thank you. It's great to be here. Wow. Well, this book, uh, less than 180 pages. So again, a great read for somebody who wants to get into Mises, dip their toe. Um, and, and it's really organized, interestingly, in just three sections. And so why, why don't we go through it that way? I, uh, you know, one of the things that Guido Holzman talks about, and he addresses an entire chapter, chapter eight of his biography of Mises to the, to the writing of this book. Um, he says, what he's given us here is the political economy of nations. And what was so interesting to me about the first part of this book is that Mises says, you know, nations and nationalism is kind of a new concept. I mean, before this, we had feudalism and monarchs, and they were always looking to expand. And so the idea of a nation or a nation say, this is modern. We think of it as ancient, but it's modern. Right. It's, 
It really comes to fruition in the 19th century, and it's closely associated with the revolutions or rebellions or resistance movements, if you want to call them, of 1848 in Europe. And Americans are mostly pretty not familiar with this stuff. But in the mid-19th century, there was a big movement in all of these larger states and empires that this idea that we as a linguistic or a national community should have more autonomy, should we should have more self-determination as a group within a larger group. This was especially relevant in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, where there had been less consolidation. In, in France, they had already largely kind of exterminated, not necessarily in the sense of murder, but just through national institutions, gotten rid of many of the, the smaller language groups and so on. And so there was a lot more uniform ethnically by then. But in Central and Eastern Europe, there was a lot more variety, especially in the Austrian Empire, the Hungarians, uh, Romanians, all of these different groups that existed side by side, but they were dominated in many cases by some other language group, by some other ethnic group. So in the mid 19th century, especially, they really tried to assert themselves and get more local autonomy. And Mises is pretty sympathetic to those movements, uh, recognizing that in many cases, these larger states were simply one group dominating another group. And in that sense, the, the There was a lot of co-development or a parallel development between liberalism, classical liberalism, and nationalism. So they're certainly not opposites. They certainly don't cancel each other out. I, as far as I can see in Mises' view, he's recognizing that these were related movements and that in many cases the nationalists were, were claiming to want liberal goals in terms of self-determination, maybe more freedom of trade as well. Uh, I certainly wouldn't call them radical liberal movements uh, in that sense, but they certainly wanted to decentralize and weaken these large states that had dominated them. And so to now say, to remove the concept of nationalism totally from that historical context and say, oh, nationalism is basically synonymous with uh, uh, hardcore imperialism or domination of other groups and so on, uh, that, that's, that's a bit of an anachronistic way of looking at it. Well, it's interesting. He, he had intended for this book to be titled Imperialism. And there was a change with this publisher. They wanted nation, state, and economy. And as uh, he, Mises himself points out, and also Leland Yeager, the late Leland Yeager, who was, of course, here at Auburn University, provided the, the German to English translation of this book in the 1980s. And, and wow, is Leland just an unbelievable man, an unbelievable writer, an unbelievable scholar, and a polyglot speaker of many languages. I mean, what, what a guy. So, uh, you know, get this book from our website. It's in cheap paper back and you're going to enjoy meet, uh, Leland Yeager's introduction. But as he points out, one of the things Mises was trying to do here is make sense of or explain the economies of pre-war and post-war Germany and also pre-war and post-war what is now Austria, which had been the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, so talk about that. That's the, the book's nation, state, and economy, three things that are very related but different. Well, yes, it's tied to a very specific historical problem. Uh, in his note, uh, his introductory note, uh, Leland Yeager talks a lot about this book as compared to uh, Keynes's book on the Versailles Treaty and uh, the economic consequences of the peace, I believe, was the name of uh, Keynes's book. And just comparing the two and how they both attempted to deal with a lot of the same issues. And so Mises is here trying to look at the problem of nationalism, which was a huge problem after the war in terms of, OK, well, you've got a city like Danzig. Is this a Polish city or is this a German city? What should we do with it? Who should it belong to? What, who's in the majority in these places? And that was so much of the project that came out of World War I was this these redrawing of borders based on linguistic majority and national groups. And that led to a lot of problems later, but it also was, in some cases, solved problems as well. And because there had been groups that were dominated by other groups. But then that leads us to the issue. So, OK, we work out this national uh, issue. We, we decentralize these empires. We, we grant local cities and regions to whoever's in the linguistic majority there. And that, of course, is then going to lead to maybe some refugee situations where, oh, you, you're suddenly now in the minority and you've got to move somewhere else 100 miles down the road. And so on. So those are all issues uh, that are significant. However, Mises also wants to look at the issue of then, OK, let's say that we've now worked out this issue of everybody gets to live in their own state with their own majority. And internally within that, they have some autonomy and they're not dominated by another group. Fine. Fine. 
But what does that mean in terms of relations between all those different groups? And so that's an important economic issue is how much trade should happen. What is the issue of maintaining a national defense? Should we be autarkic? Should we have peaceful trade with other countries? And that's what comes in then to his comparison between peaceful and liberal nationalism, which he creates that one category, and then there's imperialistic nationalism, which is the other one. And obviously, he comes down on the side of pacifistic nationalism um, and that that's a good thing because it's the the general vision is, okay, it's, it's it would be uh, ideal to have all of these different groups have their own state, essentially. And however, it's that's not a good end point in the sense that we can't then just make all those groups be self-sufficient. It's not even practical, even if it were. But even if it were possible, it wouldn't be a good thing because all these groups could greatly increase the standard of living and also promote peace by trading with everyone else. So it seems that what Mises is trying to do here is just create a whole vision of political economy where domestically speaking, people are able to exercise their political rights and their influence on legislation and domestic policy at this local level where they're part of the national group that has largely just control within that one area. However, outside those boundaries, there should be also be an attitude of liberalism and free trade and open engagement with all of these other groups, as well as also relatively free migration um, as well. And so all of those issues come together, and it's nicely woven together. I mean, I think if, if reading it, you, you would come across a lot of examples that if you don't have historical interest, you might grow bored, I suppose, with long discussions about the history of uh, – um, German politics in the late 19th century and so on. But those are all in the service of illustrating his points about why this is what we should be doing. And so it starts out, as you would expect, with a, with a discussion of what nationhood is and what the nations are, but then gets into the economics of warfare and the economics of trade and how one national group should view another national group. And of course, throughout it all is the strain of just this liberal attitude that Mises adopted, that we should we should be open toward engaging with other groups, um, but not to the point of absorbing them and attempting to impose our own way of life upon those other groups. So let's let, let's draw this out a little bit. Mises sort of lays out three elements of what he calls the nationality principle. And first and foremost is self-determination, which we've been talking about, which, by the way, oftentimes requires uh, a, an allowance of secession. Uh, this is a secessionist book, just like liberalism is a secessionist book, I would argue. So self-determination is the first element of the nationality principle. The second one is peace, which means that this self-deterministic uh, nation of sorts is not it, hopefully uh, outwardly expansive or aggressive. And the third element, which, which he lists a little later in the book, is that we recognize the division of labor via trade. We're, we're not trying to create self-sufficient uh, autarky nations. We recognize the benefits material benefits and otherwise, the cultural benefits of, of trade and division of labor. And so we need to separate economy and state. He actually has a, a, a very delicious sentence in this book about the separation of economy and state, which I, which I really enjoy. That's the kind of writing that you get from Mises. You just get these sentences that even in translation, even a hundred years later, are, are just so pithy and, and, and just so applicable today. That's, that's why you have to read this man. Uh, you, you know, if if you want to consider yourself uh, educated in economics or or liberalism as an American today, I, I would argue you have to read this man. Now, maybe you don't have to read his whole canon, uh, but but a place like nation, state, and economy is a, a, a great place to start. So um, let's talk about that. What you know, the division of labor and trade, and how important that is in his worldview. Well, just because, well, as he points out, the world is physically different from place to place. And those different places are going to have uh, different physical realities, and those people are going to have different resources and different skills because of that. And the only way then that you can really improve people's standard of living is then by allowing trade between all those different groups. And it really shouldn't be a problem that that group next to you has a different language than you. And and that's that's the point he consistently makes, is if... If all the world is actually liberal, then none of these distinctions really make 
any difference that people are just going to be willing to trade with each other and it, it, it won't even matter. And he even has an interesting so- aside in there about how really the true ideal situation is when all the world speaks one language. And then we wouldn't even have to overcome these problems anymore. It would be totally, it would be so much more efficient if we didn't have to waste time translating books is basically what he said. Well, that's basically what's happened 100 years later. The whole world speaks English. Right. And I, that's greatly to everyone's advantage, I think. And, and really, uh, if you were to speculate about what is the legacy of this book, I think you could talk about how um, part of the reason, I mean, extrapolating from Mises, we could argue that part of the reason the global economy has globalized uh, so much is because of the language issue, is that it's much easier to communicate. Obviously, I'm joking. There are tens of millions of people in, in China and India and other places who don't speak English. But if you could only speak one language and you were coming out of the womb today, um, English would probably be it. And, and in a sense, we, you know, uh, those of us who are American benefit greatly from that because our native tongue is also – we have the world's reserve currency. Now we have the world's reserve language. And, and uh, it, right. it, it really is interesting. And I noticed that sentence you pointed out where he says, look, even from the perspective of cosmopolitanism, another word in the news today uh, amongst the Tucker Carlson's and the Yoram Hazoni's and versus the, uh, the uh, Niskansen centers, um, you know, even from a cosmopolitan worldview, it would – it, it, it would almost make the world more seamless. It would reduce friction and transaction costs of, of a sort if we all spoke the same language. And you know, the other thing that struck me is you hear you hear even libertarians um, mention this with respect to uh, travel in the eurozone and the euro itself. You, you know, it wasn't that long ago when you went to Europe, you had to get a bunch of currencies and pay uh, whatever two percent uh, at the little kiosk if you were going to go from Germany to France to Switzerland. And well, in Switzerland, you still do, but uh, that, that's interesting that he was that, that he was seeing that. Um, the other thing that really st- strikes me, and Ben Powell notices this as well. We'll get to him later on the con- on the topic of migration as it relates to this book. Is Mises is obsessed with languages? We saw this in liberalism, which we had a, an, an earlier podcast with you as well as the guest, he keeps talking about polyglot nations and linguistic minorities. And, and he even says that, that uh, nation is a speech community. Well, well, this seems a little weird today. What, what's his hang up on languages? Well, uh, it relates to the time again, of course, because as we're talking about post-World War I Europe, it's easy to see how the different groups would divide out by language. Um, and Europe still very much reflects that reality, right? Norwegians speak Norwegian, and the Swedes speak Swedish. Now, of course, most people in the cities speak English, or I mean, the Swedes speak Swedish, and but most people in the cities speak English. Uh, if you go out to the countryside or people who are older, they don't speak English, but that seems to be coming the international language more and more. But that, of course, was much less the case. I suppose maybe the educated people spoke French a mm-hmm. uh, hundred years ago. But in Romania, I mean, you just you didn't encounter except in certain population centers. There were always German speakers because the Germans had populated so many of the cities in Eastern Europe. Uh, So there were these they were truly polyglot. But German speakers in the cities had different interests than the Polish speaking people in the countryside in that part of Europe. And so that then happened to coincide with different economic interests, partly because um, the global economy had not permeated all those groups to a different ex- extent and that if you were in rural Poland or rural Hungary or whatever, you just simply didn't participate in the global economy the way someone in Prague would have. And so all of these different divisions, um, which, uh, of course, political scientists would all find uh, we would call cross-cutting cleavages. <laughs> these these different groups, how do they divide out and how do they have some things in common and so he's looking at all of that. He's a very brilliant political scientist, actually. I mean, it's really shameful that he isn't read more often in those departments. Uh, and he's trying to figure out what are some of the things we can point to that really would define these different groups and how can we help them uh, organize themselves better. So he probably just settled on language as uh, something that uh, seemed to be a good, convenient way of doing that. And I th- and he also seems to be arguing from the point of view of his experience in war in that he noted, of course, that the United States and Canada and Britain all happened to be fighting on the same side. And he would say, well, that's not a coincidence. And he explicitly says the United States and England are the same nation. 
uh, which I've never seen anyone just come out and say before. Um, but since he's defining these nations as linguistic groups, he just says, oh, well, they're different states, but they're the same nation. And you could, I, I guess he was arguing that Austria proper, at least, and Germany are the same nation as well. Um, but look but, at World War One. The English called the German the Hun. They were foreign. They seemed weird. And if they'd all spoken English, I mean, that, that's why we view Canadians as almost uh, half brothers or something. I think there's a lot to it. They seem if if they're demystified. Yes, I mean it's not a coincidence that people are far less concerned about the Canadian border than the Mexican border. It's not just the economic difference; it's also the cultural and linguistic difference yeah. as well. Plus, you never walk around and you see some Canadians at the next table at, at a restaurant, and you think, "I can tell those people are Canadians." Uh, they barely even have an accent that's identifiable, and so those are all real-world things that make these people seem more like they're just your neighbors. And yeah, Mises, who was very adroit and not at all naive on issues like this, uh, certainly, I'm sure, would have noticed that sort of thing. Well, as 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 interested as he is in language, he he expressly rejects the idea of racial nationalism. And, and I'll give you a couple examples. One is he said. You know, someone can be a German living in Germany, speaking German, thinking in German without a drop of German blood. And he also said, you know, there are plenty of people in England and France, for example, who do have German blood from various conquests in Europe over, over the years, but, but they're not Germans because they're thinking and speaking in English or French. So, so elaborate on that. And as you mentioned off, offline here, uh, he anticipated possibly the the uh, uh, racial type of racial cleansing that occurred in Nazi Germany. Right. He was very explicit and careful to note that nation and race are two different things, that you can have uh, people of uh, various racial groups or ethnic backgrounds who are just subsumed into the same national group. And, of course, Mises was a German-speaking Jew and probably considered himself as the same nation as other middle-class people from his city and uh, his wherever it was that uh, he was interacting with others. And so, I mean, certainly given our experience, that would make perfect sense. If you encounter someone in this country that uh, may look slightly different from you, but they speak with the same accent and they speak the same language, you're, just, you're probably not going to have a negative reaction to that person. You're just going to view them as someone who's very similar to you for the most part. And so anybody then, and he speaks of that in terms of migration as well, in terms of small numbers migrating to a new place, by the third or fourth generation, he says explicitly, they're going to be they're going to be well within that language group. They're going to be uh, assimilated within that national group. Their background doesn't really matter in those cases. Mm -hmm. Only if you have an enclave that forms uh, where people maintain their old national groups uh, does that become an issue. And he noted this as well from the issue of colonies and so on. This is very important in uh, for the British. So he noted, OK, so you're an Englishman. You want to move somewhere else? Well, there are any number of places in the world where you can move and not even have to change your uh, your Anglo Saxonness. And he he uses Anglo Saxon really to just kind of describe this cultural group, as far as I can see. So you can move to the U.S., you can move to Canada, you can move to Australia, you can move to South Africa at the time, as he saw it. And you're still Anglo Saxon. You're no longer an Englishman, he says. But you're still an Anglo-Saxon. You're still part of that national group. And then he points out that Germany never had that. I mean, there were like a, like Namibia, I think, is a German language uh, place. Uh, what I think it was called Southwest Africa back then. Um, but I mean, your options are extremely limited as a German in terms of going somewhere else. Now, those Germans, as many, many did, they could go to immigrate to North America, but they would eventually lose their language uh, and their Germanness over time, and they would just become basically Anglo-Saxons. And we've seen that happen, right? Nobody considers Germans to be really a perceptibly different group uh, from the English saxon although right up until World War I, that was true, right? There was all this anti-German sentiment and violence and so on, and they finally got rid of all the German language schools that were common in the United States. Uh, but, I mean, it's hard to argue with them, that at least on some level, I, th I think I would, I would dispute the idea that this is by far the most overriding factor. I think that's what he seems to be. I think he goes a little too far in there saying that, well, it mostly almost totally comes down to your language group. And 
He barely discusses religion as an important issue. I think that's actually quite important. Uh, but I mean, just taking it by itself as an important factor, yeah, uh, if, if you can move to Canada, if you can move to Australia and barely have to change really even the literature you read, right? You can, if you move, if you send your kid to school in Australia, he's still going to read like Jane Eyre. Right. There's not even going to be a difference in national uh, literature. He probably won't read, I don't know, Moby Dick, but as he would in America. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I don't think our schools have people read those things anymore, maybe. But uh, uh, you don't even have to change that. So your history is almost unchanged if you move to another English speaking place. And, yeah, I think all those are very important issues. And other nations don't necessarily have that experience. And he uses the term assimilation a few different times, which sa- which has a right wingy connotation in the U.S. today. And we see this in the news. I mean, uh, Donald Trump just uh, tweeted something about a couple of these members of Congress, Ilan Omar, who's Muslim. I guess she's originally from Somalia. Um, and in talking about if you don't like it, go back. Um, if you don't love America, if you don't assimilate. So the, these tensions aren't new. And I, But I also think Mises recognized that uh, it can be problematic. If a linguistic group, uh, you know, he talks about like the Dutch experience in New York City. If they, uh, you know, most new immigrants do live in immigrant neighborhoods, oftentimes with people from the same nation or the same language or the same religion, you know. So what's what's interesting to me is that Mises is pretty clear eyed about all this stuff and that a, a thin reader would just says, oh, Mises is a cosmopolitan globalist. And there's a lot of truth to that, but there's also a lot of truth to the idea that he saw all this stuff uh, w- without rose tinted glasses, that he understood the, that that tension and friction could could be part of all this, and that the li- the real point of the liberal program, is, you know, the the real cosmopolitan outlook is the ability to understand and respect a, a life and a culture and society unlike one's own, rather than the desire to impose worldwide sort of a cosmopolitan uh, globalism in the form of you know, certain kinds of rights, certain kinds of governance, which I, which I certainly think that globalism represents today, political globalism. And so, um, you know, we can always argue about what someone would think about things today. But, uh, I, you know, the w- one thing that, that crops up again and again, you got to read Mises carefully and in context. And this, this book gives you a lot of both. Um, I, I, I want to I uh, consider this idea that he, he gets into about war and and you know as we mentioned earlier one of the one of the the ideas of a of a good nationalism is self deterministic and not aggressive outwardly uh, but that's of course not always what happens and and uh, World War One the Great War was still very very fresh on his mind so a couple points for you Ryan first he makes the the point that hey, hey you know socialism is actually not it doesn't generate peace because when you begin to control the means of production, you're sort of ready-made for war. It's easier than in a free economy to sort of ramp up for war because you're already telling people what to produce and how much and where and why. And the second point he makes is that, uh, but the flip side is that socialism destroys pro- property, which destroys your economic power and the wealth that gives you the ability to go wage war. Right. Yeah. That uh, To that point... Um... The the something that states should always keep in mind is that if you wish to have the ability to wage war well, you want to be as prosperous a society as you can, because those societies will be able to purchase more in armaments and uh, and to have just more sway internationally in terms of uh, economic power. Uh, you're less likely to be uh, bombed and invaded by a country that depends upon you for capital and goods and for lots of other things. Uh, and this has always been. Although people talk all the time about the U.S.'s military power, the real strength of the U.S. has been in the fact that it has such a gigantic economy that it could win any war of attrition. And this is a point uh, that has been made by some historians, is that it wasn't really the U.S.'s nuclear arms, for example, that prevented Stalin from invading Eastern Europe. It was the fact that Stalin knew how the U.S. had beat the Nazis. And it was the fact that the U.S. could just crank out limitless numbers of airplanes and tanks. And Stalin knew that... Even if it doesn't escalate to a nuclear war, the U.S. is just going to completely outdo us in terms of producing armaments because they're so much richer. And so they're eventually going to win whatever war, whether it be a war of attrition or whatever that we try to do. So there's no point in even trying because they're just so much richer. And uh, some countries have been 
uh, very uh, adroit on that point, and some have not. Uh, I don't know what how they think they're going to wage war successfully without a high standard of living that they need to finance a war. Uh, but of course, Mises makes that ob- obvious point. I mean, he, he understood this. And he notes that that's a choice you have to make as a regime. It's the issue of, do we want to be on a constant war footing and pursue an autarkic type of economy? And in that case, Mises said, that's possible. You can have this kind of uh, um, self-protecting economy that relies only on domestic producers. He says, the problem, though, is that your economy, your standard of living is going to be about 50 years behind what it could be. And spe- writing in 1919, he's saying if if most of these European countries pursued a truly uh, uh, self-sufficient economy, uh, assuming that a war could strike at any minute, they'd have to go back to basically an 1830s standard of living was his idea. And, and also it then becomes something of a self-fulfilling prophecy is that, oh, well, we're not going to trade with anybody else because we have to be able to produce all of our goods ourselves. So that increases the likelihood that you can actually end up having a war with your neighbors because of the cost then become much lower. And so, of course, he was always pushing the idea of liberalism. The always at the core of his writing is always the idea that we should constantly promote the idea of liberalism, because as he says explicitly, liberalism is both nationalist um, and uh, cosmopolitan, because it has it, it's interested in the idea of letting people have local self-determination, but it also recognizes the idea that it, you'd have to have peaceful relations with all of your neighbors. Uh, as well. So he says, sure, yeah, you could be paranoid and just assume that a war is always around the corner. But in the meantime, you're just shooting yourself in the foot for two reasons. You're going to be poor um, compared to your neighbors. And then on top of that, you're probably going to be able to wage war less well because you're not going to have the riches that you need to uh, uh, wage a successful campaign. And so the whole system really tends toward then encouraging international trade and liberalism in, in international relations as well. And so, and that's a nice thing about reading Mises. Is he's never pie in the sky about the need for self-defense and that sort of thing. And he recognizes the, the value of alliances. And after World War II, he even wrote a long essay, which we ran on our website a little while ago, uh, talking about how really all of these different ethnic groups of Eastern Europe need to form kind of this uh, federation together for defense from the Soviets. And, and this was right after the war. And you say, but, but all those ethnic groups need to be totally, uh, have total self-determination at the local level. So, you know, there'd be like the Slavic groups and there'd be the Poles and the Hungarians and so on. Internally, they all need to do their own thing because we don't want the Poles trying to dominate the Hungarians and vice versa. But then they could just have this permanent military alliance that would then help them then defend themselves from outside threats. So he recognized those needs. But but at the core was still the same program that he does here 30 years earlier is the idea that at the local level, you need to have uh, majorities that are limited to whoever's a lopsided majority in that linguistic group, because otherwise one group's going to try and dominate a neighbor group. But the way you can avoid that is just ensuring peaceful relations between those groups. Now, there's going to be changes over the time. People are going to move depending on where it's relatively overpopulated in terms of population size relate, um, compared to the amount of capital available. Because, um, of course, overpopulation doesn't just mean a lot of people. It means a lot of people compared to the amount of capital available. People are going to move around, but he discusses this in liberalism as well, is that there'll, there'll be slow demographic changes in places, and you can deal with that through secession movements and one part of a state joining another part of a state so that they still are able to take advantage of the local linguistic or ethnic majority and so on. So it's a very fluid system, but at the core of it is always free and uh, liberal uh, economic relations between all of the different groups. Well, Ben Powell makes this point. He says, you know, if, if nations are spontaneous, then by definition, they are ever in flux and, and changing. And I think that's an important point. But I also I also think it's important to point out, you know, you said something that Mises said, which is pretty astonishing, that the, the, a liberal program can include both a national and a cosmopolitan global element. And, and if we think about that, it's, it's just always so hard, seemingly, if we look at history, to prevent any sort of nationalism from becoming outward facing and aggressive. But we can, we can certainly understand a love or affection for a place and an identification with a place. And I would say Mises had both for Vienna. 
not so much his hometown, but but Vienna, and and it hurt him to leave, and obviously under horrible circumstances. So I think I would say Mises was proudly Viennese. It, does that make him a bad guy by today's libertarian standards? I think the answer is no. Well, just on a practical level, uh, if <laughs> say you've lived in the city for twenty, thirty years, it's, if you hate it, you should move. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a good point. And wouldn't you feel a natural affinity for the people who live within a 20-mile radius of you and you've lived there? Well, New, New Yorkers don't. They hate each other. Oh, okay. They hate everybody. <laughs> but you, but no, uh, continue. That's But that's just natural, right? These are the people who are familiar to you. You, of course, speak the same language. You, you frequent the same parks. All of those issues, you have friends in those neighborhoods. Why shouldn't you feel differently about those people than someone who lives 2,000 miles away, even though they're technically in the same nation state as you? It seems weird to claim that I should feel exactly the same about Bostonians as I feel about people in my neighborhood. Uh, I guess that's something we're told growing up that all Americans are the same and all parts of America, oh, you know, deserve your equal loyalty. But I'm not quite sure that's practical. Uh, just on a human level. But, I mean, going back to the European uh, and to the point you were making a little bit about how uh, liberalism is, of course, it can be compatible with both cosmopolitanism and nationalism. I always think of the Poles in cases like this. Now, the Poles, um, ever since the fall of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, after the Middle Ages ended, they, they no longer were a large, powerful state in Europe, and they then began to be dominated by, by larger, more powerful neighboring states, largely because they were richer uh, and more urbanized. They, they were then began to be dominated by the Russians and the Prussians. Now, the only reason Poland exists today as a nation or a group or a nation state or anything like that is because they were highly nationalistic in the sense that they were very, always very self-conscious and trying to preserve their culture um, from those around them who were basically trying to exterminate them. So all those different partitions that um, Poland underwent in the 17th and 18th century where Poland was divided up and ceased to be a state and so on, is if it means, if cosmopolitanism means lecturing the Poles about how they should have just given up on trying to be Polish, then I'd, I'm not real sympathetic to that view. I don't think there was anything wrong with the Poles attempting to maintain uh, their culture, their language, and um, their people as something separate from the Prussians and the Russians. I, I would not define cosmopolitanism, though. I think it would be wrong to say, oh, well, you know, just invite people in. Just invite the Prussians and the Russians to kind of come on in and dominate your cities and do whatever and split you up because these are just all arbitrary borders and they don't mean anything. All those, those borders around Poland that, that the Russians just came in and erased, you know, that never meant anything anyway. So what are you Poles complaining about? And uh, I don't think the world would be a better place if the Poles had just given up on that and said, you know, whatever, we give up of being Polish is is meaningless and will just be nothing or something else. And I think, and of course we know that uh, reading from his other works that uh, Mises was extremely well-versed in Polish history because of course he was born and I believe in a region that's now Poland and was familiar uh, with that part of the world very much so. Um, he was well aware of this and probably was familiar with all those various battles that took place between those ethnic groups. But to be fair, Time has changed this. It matters less today, presumably, that, you know, what's the difference between a German and a Prussian and a Pole than it did 100, 150 years ago. I mean, these things have, been, have ameliorated somewhat. And, and if, if whatever sort of uh, bizarro version of global capitalism we have today, uh, as jaundiced as it might be, has still been an absolute glorious achievement by any standards. And it, not only has it made us all immeasurably richer, but it, it's, it's reduced tensions. And, and um, in other words, it's politics that keeps us inflamed, uh, but markets have absolutely uh, increased the case for peace in, in, in Europe, absolutely. Well, and Mises would say it is not necessary that you have your own state as an ethnic group. Um, say that the Prussians and the Russians had always granted great political economy or uh, political freedom and economic freedom to the Poles as an ethnic group. 
they probably wouldn't have tried very hard to get their own state. It wouldn't have been very important to them. And the point that Mises makes is this is Switzerland. And he notes, well, the, the German-speaking Swiss have declined on many occasions to join Germany or join Austria, just as the French-speaking Swiss have declined to join France because they were already free in Switzerland to do whatever they wanted, you know, relatively, and, and exercise their own freedoms there. So Switzerland, of course, is a, is a polyglot place where you have lots of different people speaking languages. And this, of course, as you know, meant more historically. It was, they're much more integrated now, but they still have their different language communities and so on. But since they're, they are all pretty much guaranteed their own autonomy, depending on what canton they're in and so on, no one is agitating for, well, we need to break off and form our just our own German Swiss state and things like that. And so anywhere, Mises would say anywhere you look where you have probably groups driving real hard to get their own autonomous uh, state, nation state of their own, it's probably because they're being denied some sort of autonomy wherever it, it, wherever, uh, it is. And that's, Mises always makes that point through all of his early works is that a state that is liberal or a situation that is liberal, then boundaries don't matter. Then who's in charge of the state doesn't matter because the state isn't oppressing anybody. And so it very much depends on that. Just how abusive is the state is going to drive just how much an ethnic or language group wants its own state or to be separate. Well, that's a perfect segue. I want to turn to the issue of when a state isn't liberal. So uh, the... Uh, Society for the Development of Austrian Economics had its annual meeting in 2018, and they had a panel, among other things, uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of this book, 1919 to 2019. And we did the same thing at our research conference earlier this year. And as part of that, Ben Powell, I mentioned him earlier, he's a professor at Texas Tech University. He wrote a paper called Solving the Misesian Migration Conundrum. And, and that what the paper attempts to address is how should migration and immigration work when states aren't liberal? And he, you know, he makes some really interesting points here, one of which I made back in our, in our uh, immigration roundtable series of articles, which is that Mises wrote really quite scant few pages on the exact issue of immigration relative to the thousands of pages in his total work. Uh, there's, there's literally three or four uh, mentions in human action uh, and, and really liberalism and this book, um, Nation, State, and Economy, are where we get you know, a, a few pages here and there. Um, and, and moreover, he was concerned about uh, not only polyglot nations, but about um, you know assimilation and other things that we still find ourselves concerned about with migration. But he, he, he's generally viewed, and I think correctly so, for his time as, as a guy who is for uh, open, open immigration. You know, Ben Powell, who's a big open borders guy, uh, actually, you know, drills down a little bit in this paper. I, I, unfortunately, the Review of Austrian Economics, which published it, I believe still has it beyond a paywall. Uh, if I can get a copy from him that we can turn into a PDF, I'll post it on the site w along with this uh, uh, podcast. But, you know, he really brings up some of the questions about how do we address things when when countries aren't liberal? How, how do we, how do we uh, deal with the uh, inducements and everything. And one thing that he points out in Nation, State, and Economy and that Powell also brings up is this, you know, we always think of immigration problems because we live in America and a lot of people want to come here even today with all of our screwed up government. Uh, but for the Germans, for example, he pointed out, you know, losing people, migration was a big problem. So we think of walls and borders uh, on the incoming side. Well, a lot of countries, you know, ha had a problem with losing people. It makes you poor, especially back in a, in a time when, you know, agricultural labor was in, in demand. Well, it's funny. Uh, Mises uses the phrase, there's a sentence in here where he says, you know, th this, uh, this, this place was relative, I forget what place he was referring to. He says, this place was relatively liberal. You were, you could, you were free to emigrate if you wanted to. And uh, and people forget that restrictions on emigration were a real thing. And I did an article on this last year, I believe, uh, making precisely this point. Everybody thinks immigration when they think about migrations. But really, emigration was a big issue in Central and Eastern Europe in the 19th and early 20th century. And, they, and states, non-liberal states especially, would attempt to use immigration controls as a way of manipulating demographics and the population to favor the majority ethnic or language groups. So in many cases, um, they would, of course, extract money from you uh, 
uh, if uh, you wanted to leave because they thought maybe if you were leaving to avoid paying taxes, well, we're going to you're going we're going to hit you hard on the way out. Or worse, if you were leaving to avoid conscription, we're going to make you pay through the nose on your way out. Uh, but in other cases, if you were a Jew in many cases and you left Russia, for example, they didn't want you back. So if you ever tried to come back and visit family and so I'm sorry, we revoked your citizenship while you were gone. So there were a lot of strategies used like this to uh, try and choke out the smaller ethnic minority groups. And so that was a big issue. And we don't we don't think about that much today, but it's still an issue in terms of uh, I think a lot the controlling political coalitions try to use uh, immigration then to to buttress their own side, and you hear a, a lot about that um, from especially restrictionists who who are convinced that the other side is bringing in too many people that are going to help them and so on. And Mises, most of the time, he's looking at it and seeing well. Most of the time, you just don't see huge migrations of people, at least in the time that he's writing. So this is the teens and twenties, and part of that was because. It was a lot more alien to to go across a national border back then, whereas you know you're from some other country and American culture probably seems like a very very different thing, and it was so different and communication was so bad back with the home country and so on that actually you can and you can find this in research on American immigration at least a lot of people went back, they would come here make their fortune and then go back to Italy or whatever and set up shop there with the money that they had saved. And suddenly now they were upper middle class people uh, in the home country. But I think there's been a, an easing of the problems of migration so that it's no longer seen as big a deal uh, to go to the country next door or just a couple doors over. And this is what we see, of course, in the Northern Triangle of Central America and Mexico and so on. And of course, these people feel more familiar with American culture because they just see so much of it on TV and in popular culture and so on. And so I think there's just a much different feeling about it. So how to deal with that? Well, it's different for a country like the U.S., although the U.S. talks a lot about uh, its sovereignty being a problem. So on the, the reality is the U.S. is so huge uh, that... Um, the entire country of El Salvador could move to the U.S. and it wouldn't really make that big a difference because you're talking about six and a half million people uh, out of 320 million people. It's not going to uh, cause a major national upheaval, especially since those people would probably be spread around. However, for a smaller country, that's a much bigger deal. And so often when I hear people uh, complaining about the idea of nationalism and sovereignty and so on being diluted in the U.S., they, they seem to have an excessive focus on just the United States, uh, not recognize the importance of these ideas of sovereignty and borders and so on to these smaller states especially, because those small states can be much more easily overcome by migrations. And so the stakes are much higher for them. And so I think um, when you look at those issues, Mises doesn't actually talk about that much at all. The small countries, when he uses his examples to talk about immigration, he talks mostly about the U.S. or about Australia. And he does note that Australia has a small population so that it could be much more easily overcome then by migrations from, say, Indonesia or Japan. And in those cases, he comes off as a restrictionist where he's talking about the smaller uh, countries. He does say, well, the U.S. doesn't really have to worry about that because it's just so big and vast that it would take just huge amounts of migration. So far away. Yeah, and far. And but we need to think of this in terms of smaller countries and how they deal with those issues. And and of course, one of the things that Mises I think would would say is that okay, well, free trade is I think your starting point. And you always need to just assume that free trade is extremely important. It's going to uh, help to mitigate some of those issues, also prevent conflict to some extent. And um, at least limited migration is always important in terms of matching up capital with, with necessary labor. And so he's certainly not a hardliner on it, but he recognizes the peril that some small population countries are in in terms of immigration, and especially uh, in, by the 20s, he's saying that sort of thing uh, in liberalism. And so he doesn't spell out really a clear program here. Mm -hmm. Um, but underneath it all is always the issue of, well, it wouldn't even matter that much in a truly liberal state because even if you had a new influx population, um, there wouldn't be any big state apparatus to use to oppress whatever group is now suddenly in the minority. But also recognizing then that the nature of the state would change as different groups uh, come in.
And so I, I you know, Mises just is going to take, uh, as he often does, a more limited and pragmatic approach here. And it's very much going to depend on the situation, um, on how big the, the countries are involved and what the stakes are. And those are things that need to be considered. It, it's... I don't think you can just make a blanket statement about people who assert some sort of a concern about their local ethnic group as being naturally xenophobic or so on. I don't think that's clear. But I would say that it's much more important for a smaller country than a large country. As an American, I think fears are somewhat overstated. Um, but I don't think you should take uh, the reality in America and impose it on then some small Eastern European country and say, hey, you know, it's no big deal for us, so therefore it's no big deal for you. Well, this is a point that Powell makes in his paper, and he's trying to come up with some actual concrete policy guidelines for immigration. He says, well, because, for instance, Latin American immigrants in the U.S. are, are such a small percentage of the population, relatively small percentage, and, and Islamic immigrants in Europe are a relatively small percentage of the, over, of the overall population, that sort of the general default of open migration, both for uh, economic benefits and also for, uh, you know, for humanity's sake, ought, ought to stand when there's no problem d d due to the numbers. But um, he actually talks about the, the institutions of freedom, and he's paraphrasing Mises here. He says, if the immigrants' own belief systems were in part responsible for that dysfunctional system, and they bring those beliefs with them to the destination country in too great of numbers, too rapidly, to assimilate to the beliefs in their destination country, they could erode the very institutions responsible for the high productivity that attracted them in the first place. Thus, immigration could, in principle, turn a relatively free destination country where Mises wouldn't see immigrants as a problem into a more interventionist state where immigration does create the problems Mises fears. And again, I'm quoting from Ben Powell in his paper. So, uh, you know, again, that sounds a little right-wingy, like these, you know, these newcomers are going to bring their own newfangled ways and they're going to swamp the locals. Uh, but again, it's, it's Mises seeing this with a clear eye. And I think to his great credit, uh, ben Powell attempting to straddle a little bit here and say, hey, look, I can address some of these concerns of the re immigration restrictionists um, and propose a policy which is based on a reflexive open borders approach, but allows for an analysis of events on the ground or instant events or whatever it might be. So uh, again, it's called solving the Misesian migration conundrum, and I'm going to try to, to uh, link to the paper. So um, Sometimes the Mises Institute is criticized for being for closed borders. I don't think that's true. We have a lot of different writers, uh, Ryan McMakin sitting across from me, one of them. I would characterize you as, I guess, a relatively open borders person. I would certainly characterize Per Byland or Walter Block as uh, people who, who advocate open borders and even do so on, on Mises.org on our website. Um, and their, their perspectives provided by Lou Rockwell, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, I've written a, a little bit on immigration, but mostly summarizing others. So we have we have a lot of different uh, views on it here, and none of those views revolve around using a federal or even a local state apparatus to apprehend people and and boss people around. Uh, but you know, even the open pure open borders perspective usually comes with a caveat: uh, subject to health and criminal background checks. And if you accept even that caveat, that, that means you're going to have to have some sort of intake center, which some people will try to skirt. And that intake center, while this processing for background and disease and criminality is going on, is, is going to have to have some sort of detention element to it, as, as awful as that sounds. And, you know, does that mean barbed wire? Does that mean, uh, does that mean you're going to draw blood from people to uh, determine whether they have certain diseases. I mean, that's a pretty invasive thing. Are you going to detain them for days or weeks while these, you know, imagine having to do a background check in, in China on, on a name that's very foreign to us. I and mean, there might be a thousand people with that name. It's not, it's not so easy to say, oh, oh well, of course we can just have basic uh, criminal background and health checks. That, that, that actually requires quite a bit of state apparatus and some sort of centers that, that are currently being, I think, rightfully criticized on our borders in, in, you know, when we have people in, in bad conditions who have, who have attempted to enter the country. So it's, you know, these are thorny things. And, and uh, libertarians don't do thorny too well sometimes. We, we like to be black and white, and I get that. 
Um, so, you know, if, if critics, including listeners, want to say, you know, the, the, you know we've got to be just absolutely for open borders and the Mises Institute is full of it, I think that's fine. And I think that that's an, a view I'm willing to entertain it and, I, and, I, and read more about, which I do regularly. Uh, but I'm not going to accept a criticism that says that, that, that this is somehow this, you know, this closed border status perspective and that you want big government to kidnap people at the border. That, that, that just isn't a, a, an honest characterization. Not, neither is that, well, you don't want Mexicans in the country. So I actually do want Mexicans in the country, including uh, some friends of ours in, in Auburn. So, uh, you know, I guess the point here is that there's some complexity and, and reading Mises pr- provides some clarity. He's authoritative, of course, not dispositive on this or anything else. He's a human being. Um, and, and, you know, just give us your closing thoughts here about, about immigration in general and, and what we can take from this book in particular. Well, one issue that uh, just continues to permeate the immigration issue is the idea of uh, nationhood and who's similar enough to us that they would easily assimilate this notion. And I think something we've been kind of skirting around is the idea that maybe our uh, – our idea of nation has grown more broad over time, right? So you would think about how differently the British thought about the Hun um, back in the early 20th century or so on. <laughs> do the British really view the Germans as you know some alien culture now, and do Americans view them that way? Uh, very few would, I think. And you see this also in in, in ongoing debate about uh, immigration is, oh, well, we want people to immigrate here who are of, uh, they never put it this way, but who are, you know, basically the same nation as us. And the, and and kind of, the, you know, when they say we just want Western Europeans or whatever, what they mean is those people are close enough to us that they would easily kind of fit in to our nation. But what's interesting there is that that's changed massively over time. I, I continue to read stuff. Where people say, oh, well, you know, back in the Ellis Island days, 100 years ago, that was really just white immigration. But if you go read that stuff back then, they didn't consider the Irish. They didn't consider the Poles and the Italians to really be white people. So they had a very definition, a different definition of what white was uh, back then. And so the definition of white has really broadened. And so, you know, when you look at uh, all of these issues of race and nationalism and all of this, there seems to be kind of a broader view there. So we've changed our definition now of who potentially is an easily uh, assimilatable group. And that continues then to be a major issue, I think, in the debate uh, over immigration. And it's different for Europe than for the U.S., right? You have non-Christian immigrants over there coming into Europe here most overwhelmingly, the Christians who come or the people who come from Latin America are Christians. They also speak a European language already. I mean, those those things make a real difference, and I think um, are are relevant even to the linguistic stuff that Mises talked about. And so we we haven't really gotten away from all of these issues, even though I think the issues are broader now. We encompass our idea of the same group or potentially the same. A nation has gotten bigger. It's not nearly as limited to just people come from another Anglo-Saxon country and so on. But the the same issues remain. And so, yeah, we haven't been freed from this idea of nation being an important issue in terms of trade. I mean, we see that in trade all the time, right? Oh, the Chinese are this alien culture, and we can't trade with them, and they're they're fundamentally, uh, you know, deep down, they're all trying to conquer us and take over, and uh, this represents an alien culture. And so that stuff just comes up again and again and again. Mises would say, you know, there's nothing wrong at the domestic level then with uh, making sure that you have political borders and jurisdictions drawn in such a way that your majority ethnic group, or I guess he would say linguistic group, um, is, is pretty much unified. And I think, he, you know, to, to use that analysis then in the U.S., the U.S. should, of course, and I, you know, m- me and many other secessionist type people would say, oh, of course the U.S. should be broken up into smaller pieces that reflect the different majorities in different places or at least have more autonomy and be less of just this big conglomerate nation. And that would actually solve a lot of the issues of immigration. Just imagine if there were a couple of countries between the eastern United States and the and what is now the Mexican border. I mean, if Texas had never joined the U.S., the border situation would be significantly different um, for the U.S. and Texas both. And those things shouldn't be ignored. But 
um, the book is still relevant because even though borders have changed and ideas of nationhood have changed, the issues of, of trade, of war, um, of the, the, the necessary nature of interacting with all these groups in a liberal and open way continue to be true. And Mises continues to be right in that as globalization spreads, as trade spreads, as we're more open to trade with these other groups. Now, yeah, we're kind of in a, a situation where a lot of people are arguing against that, but I think the larger trend is clear that we're moving more toward international trade. The stakes are simply too high. People are not going to willing not be uh, willing to settle for a setback of 20 or 30 years in the standard of living in order to eliminate trade uh, with foreign countries. And so I say the basic premises of the book just are true, the same as ever. I mean, you would want to update it in terms of most people aren't going to really engage with examples of Weimar. Uh, well, I guess this is before the, the Weimar Republic really existed, but his Potsdam examples, I suppose, aren't terribly relevant to uh, the modern American. But I think we could take this and just rewrite it with some new examples, and it would continue to uh, instruct us a lot today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always... If you really want to know what Mises thought about X, Y, or Z, the best thing to do is go read Mises and find out for yourself what he thought about X, Y, and Z. And don't listen to these secondhand dealers like me and Ryan. Um, this book, Nation, State, and Economy, again, an easy read, about 175 pages. You can read it really in two sittings. If you go to our website, Mises.org, go to our bookstore, you can get this in paperback very cheaply. If you enter the code H-A-P-O-D, that's H A. POD, which stands for Human Action Podcast, you're going to get a 10% discount. And it's just one of those little sleeper books that doesn't get the credit it, it's due. And it, it's really an excellent addition to your library. And of course, you can also read it for free uh, on our website in, in PDF form. So uh, Ryan, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be back with another Human Action Podcast in just a few days uh, with Dr. Liliana Stern, who is across the street at Auburn University, an Ukrainian immigrant to the U.S., and uh, a woman who has some really interesting ideas about higher ed and how it's failing us. So uh, stay tuned for a great podcast with her, and we will catch you in just a few days. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.